ladies and gentlemen, I am just honored beyond belief to have um, one of the all-time greats, not just a, a, a Texas music legend or an American music legend, but a world music legend. He has influenced um, just so many artists and um, presently, you know, bands like... Uh, you know, like, like Gary Clark Jr. and Doyle Bram Hall II. I mean, you, they can all, myself, we can all trace our roots back to Jimmy Vaughn. And he'll be very humble to say that uh, that there are people before him and, and that, that helped open the doors and, and pave the way. But uh, when you really come down to it, you know, Jimmy is, is the guy. And I am just uh, ecstatic to have him uh, on the show today. Jimmy, how are you? I'm doing great, and, th and thanks for all the kind words. Oh, man, there's there's more where that came from, because, again, I'll probably mention it a time or two later, but, you know, the life that I've had, uh, the, the freedom to be a musician, doing this DJ thing right now, um, is, is in no small part due to your influence and the decisions that you made in your life, you know? I'm heavily influenced by you, your style, and uh, Stevie's, and everybody that you've pointed to uh, in the past, you know, uh, that, that have influenced and, and helped you along. So you, um, you recently just got off the road with Eric Clapton. You are, you were his support act for, uh, for some shows in, in where, uh, Florida? Well, we, we, we started in Texas. We did, uh, uh, Fort Worth, Austin and Houston. And then we, uh, went to New Orleans and then we went to Nashville. And then we uh, went over to Atlanta and then uh, a couple of shows in Florida. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so we did so, eight shows. So mostly mostly class. warm areas of the country. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it looks like you're skipping over um, Buffalo on this, uh, on this run where you're head a headlining act. You're coming up the uh, northeast. You're going to Cleveland uh, at the Music Room on the 13th. That's next week, and Jurgles near Pittsburgh on the 14th. So uh, that's about as close as your fans are going to, you're going to be getting to your fans here in Western Europe. But by the way, we stream worldwide, and we've also got uh, some repeater stations in the southern tier of New York State. Uh, up, we're basically from Toronto on down through to Pennsylvania on terrestrial. So we've got a lot of listeners, and I know we've got a lot of Jimmy Vaughn lovers out there. Well, great. Um I'm very excited. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks you're welcome. Now, Mike Flanagan posted a video of you doing an exceptionally great version of Larry Davis's Texas Flood. It really seemed like you guys were all just hitting on all cylinders and really, uh, really inspired for, for that performance. Well, thank you. Uh, I don't know which one that was, but... Um, well, you know, there's a lot of stuff going around social media, but... Uh, uh, your, your your organ player Mike uh, posted uh, posted that video a, a couple of days ago, I think. Yeah, uh, well, I don't know which one it was, but uh, I really enjoy playing with Mike, and uh, uh, we do a lot of stuff together. Uh, we make uh, we have a little gig that we play here in Austin, where it's just the trio. Uh, we have a drummer, our drummer, and Mike. I play guitar, and then we have uh, Cass on saxophone. And uh, we do uh, this little club, and we play all kinds of stuff that we don't really record or, you know, or have on the... Um... Anyway, we just, when we're home, we just go over there and play, you know. Yeah, that's at uh, Sea Boys in Austin, right? Yes. Yeah, I've yes. been threatening. I talk to Mike periodically because I, you know, when I uh, met him and talked to him at the show that you and I played together at the Trough back in 2019, uh, which is great, by the way. Um, he and I really connected, had a nice conversation, and uh, he was telling me about that gig. And I've been I've been threatening to come down there and visit you guys one of these days. So don't be surprised if you see me sometime. All right. <laughs> so let's just talk gear for a second uh, before we get into your uh, t talking about the album and, and some of the um, songs and collaborations on this special re retrospective that's just been released. But I mean, you go all the way back to um, to hanging with like Janis Joplin and opening for Jimi Hendrix and um, 
you actually provided Jimi Hendrix with a wah wah pedal. Is that correct? Well, uh, the, the the real story is it's it's sort of morphed into a, a a different story. But the real story is my band opened the show at SMU, uh, which was a college in Dallas, and um, it was a Saturday night, and the music stores were closed. They broke their wah wah pedal, or Hendrix did. And I had a brand new one, so they said, uh, why don't you sell me this, your Wawa pedal, and here's a hundred bucks, and uh, you can go buy you a new one on Monday. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> cool. Sure. Well, that was all it was. So, so oh, okay, so like that, that. The, 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 his broken pedal did not end up in your possession and, and passed on? No, to no, I have, I have the, uh, the, the Armand. They gave me the... Uh, this roadie gave me the Diarmond uh, wah wah pedal. I have it still. Beautiful. But, uh, what a what but an I amazing. But I don't have uh, I don't have his box. You know, which is what everybody wanted. Oh, okay, yeah. But at least uh, you have Hendrix's wah wah pedal. I mean, geez. I do. Yeah, I do. That's 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 pretty incredible. Um, <laughs> there's, uh, you know, there was th this this new box set that you've got is overwhelming with, uh, with great music. There's 96 tracks on there and it's called the Jimmy 98, right? 98. I think. Okay. Well, I, I think that the, um, the, the, the bundle that I got, um, from your publicist, uh, who I'd like to thank also Lisa, she was, uh, very kind and, and, and getting us connected for this. Um, it looked like it was 96, but it's still, it's still a lot of great music and a lot of collaborations that are just mind blowing. When you, when you look at all the people that, uh, that you work with on this, uh, you know, with different songs over there's Bonnie Ray, Delbert McClinton, John Lee Hooker, Bo Diddley, Susan Tedeschi, Lazy Lester, Doyle Bramhall, one and two, Jimmy Rogers, Albert Collins, Billy Gibbons, who we are also in the jungle show with. It's, yes. uh, it's just staggering to to see your 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 body of work throughout the uh, th throughout the decades. Um, you know, there was there's this one song that I wanted to ask you about. It's on, I think, disc two. Okay. It's uh, the Dengue Woman Blues. Okay. All right. Now you've been in a number of uh, major Hollywood movies. I remember seeing you as the guitar player in. Jerry Lee as Jerry Lee Lewis's guitar player in Great Balls of Fire. Uh-huh. And then um, there was this movie, this vampire movie with Harvey Keitel and Selma Hayek and George Clooney called uh, From Dusk Till Dawn. There's this right. scene. There's this scene where Harvey Keitel, Harvey Keitel is driving his family trying to get him away from danger in these, in this RV through the desert in Mexico or whatever it was. And this killer slow blues track comes on i remember hearing it i don't know i remember if it was in a theater or if i actually was 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 hearing it uh from, from a vhs at the time but it was uh, i knew it was you but i was rattling my brain to find out where it came from what album uh i was not familiar with it it wasn't on strange pleasure out there none of those albums from your solo album but you could hear that it was from that era of players you know with probably with bill willis and george Raines um playing on the session so how did that all come about and, and end up in the movie well uh I'll, I'll tell you um it was robert rodriguez uh the the uh director and filmmaker uh from texas uh he was making this movie and uh he called me up and he said hey i want you to play on my uh do a song or two for my new album, my new uh, movie. And uh, said it's vampires and, you know, it's, he, he described it to me. And uh, he said, uh, do you have a song? And I said, well, the first thing, here's what the first thing you do when somebody calls you and asks you if you have a song for their movie, you say yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Whether you have it or not. Absolutely. <laughs> I agree with you 100%. So... He goes, um, uh, do you have a song? And I was like, yeah, well, yeah, sure I do. And uh, so we went to 
Los Angeles, and uh, it was uh, Denny Freeman on the organ, and um, a couple of guys from L.A. that um, that he knew from around there that were good musicians. I, I can't remember their names. I'd have to look it up. But um, we went in the studio uh, in the valley there and uh, recorded that and a couple of other ones. And uh, and there there was Dean Gay Woman. <laughs> uh, well, you know, you feel free to elaborate on, on the, the subject matter of the song or not. <laughs> well, uh, uh, it was, uh, you know, I was thinking about Salma Hayek. <laughs> so, I'm sure so, a lot of people uh, were I thinking just, about Salma Hayek. I think so. So I was just, um, you know, thinking uh, if she was a vampire and she bit me, what would I do? And I don't know. I, so I, I, I made up a blues about it. All right. Man, I'm so happy that you told me that story. And, and of course, you know, Selma Hayek, beautiful. And I think she's from Columbia. You and I had spoken about, uh, you know, my tours down, down there. I mean, the women are just just unbelievably beautiful. I mean, of course, they are all over the world in Texas and Buffalo. But, you know, I especially appreciate the, them down there as well. First of all, tell us what is the included in this in this package. There's a, there's a booklet. Uh, with a lot of information from your origins, uh, but there's also some other stuff, photographs you've never released before. Um, you've got yeah, there's there's a, a f there's a book that's got all about the music and a lot of uh, personal photographs that you know that I had in a box, and we just dug everything up and and decided that. that well, actually, I sent it all to Malcolm at, from uh, the record company, and he and him and his guys uh, figured out which ones to use, and they they picked all the songs. I sent I sent them about a hundred and fifteen or twenty songs, and um, they ran out of room. So. So they cherry picked uh, the best ones, yeah. Yeah, they picked the ones that uh, he wanted on there. So, yeah. Well, and, this... uh, Malcolm is the he's the greatest uh, record guy I've ever met. And he he likes the same kind of music I do. You know, that so, helps. It really it's, helps. It's uh, really tough, man. Especially I've nowadays. Rec, I've had a lot of record deals, and uh, he's the greatest. Uh, no kidding, Malcolm guy. over at Last Records, super. All right, so yeah. let's talk about disc number one. This is primarily Fabulous Thunderbirds material and for those listeners that don't know who Jimmy Vaughn is he's the brother of Stevie Ray Vaughn older brother and um, one of the founders of the fabulous Thunderbirds if not the founder I'm not sure the exact story but um, disc one goes back into that group and um, a lot of people will probably remember the era of of MTV when you were uh, in the mix there with Eric Clapton and Buddy Guy and B.B. Uh, King and uh, U2 was, you know, uh, supporting blues music. I mean, Robert Cray, everything was mixed in with the mainstream at the time. I remember those days fondly. I mean, I was just an incredible time for, for real music. And uh, Fabulous Thunderbirds were in that mix with Tough Enough in, uh, in that record. But you have a, a history of some more stripped down um, Roadhouse Blues um, you know, records that came before that. And uh, this album features a lot of that music, and we're going to be playing that for you tonight. Some of it is like, uh, you know, Running Shoes, uh, Can't Tear It Up, uh, Why Get Up, The Crawl, you know, Wait on Time, stuff like that, um, which is actually on disc two. But um, I personally, you know, from my playing and, and kind of coming up here in Western New York, I heard a lot of the stories about you guys coming through and playing, you know, for Toby at the Imperial Garage, Toby Rotella, and uh, at the Bell Star, you know, in uh, in yeah. Boston, New York. Yeah. And uh, I remember we were talking about a, a drummer that you were um, that you were friends with from here, and you tried to get him out on the road, named Jimmy Rusick or Rusick. And yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He he's uh, he, he's he's referred to as um, very fondly again by by a lot of the the senior players around here, 
and uh, I believe he's still around, and uh, maybe I could uh, dig around and get yeah, you guys well, he connected. Yeah, was, he was a fabulous drummer, and uh, he had a style and a and a beat that was, uh, he was smooth. I don't know how to explain it, except he was ultra smooth, and there wasn't a bunch of jerking around and playing in the middle of your stuff. He knew what to do. He was He played like he was in an orchestra. But yeah. uh, uh, but it was very cool and uh, groovy. I, that's all the only way I can describe it. Uh, and so um, we used to uh, go up there and play a lot. And one time our drummer, uh, something happened, he couldn't go. And uh, so we went up there without a drummer, I think it was. And... Um, we somebody uh, recommended uh, Jimmy, uh, and um, so we called him, and he he showed up, and it was it was a lot of fun. But and then we tried to we tried to hire him. He didn't want to go anywhere. Yeah, I think um, so, he he had some family obligations that precluded uh, going out on the road and you know living that. Well, community. sure, but you know, yeah. But uh, but we tried to get him, and uh, he's a great drummer. Well, we're going to play some of that stuff uh, from the from the Thunderbirds right now, um, and let's talk about uh, let's talk about you know the importance of the shuffle. I mean, the guys, a lot of when anybody that gets into my band that it wants to be more than just a fill in drummer, I point them right to the uh, Albert Collins stuff. Uh, you know the old uh, the, sure. the old instrumentals like from from the Cool Sound Albert Collins or Truckin'. Um, Don't lose your cool. Yeah, don't lose your cool. I actually, I did, I did a song very similar to that on uh, two records ago called "Bags of Cool" because you know it combined, um, you know, because "Don't Lose Your Cool" actually is kind of evocative of uh, uh, Bags Groove, you know, uh, you know, you know the song I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think Milt yeah. Jackson, right? Uh, right. Yeah. So, so I kind of put this thing together. I wanted one of those up tempo shuffles like that. Maybe I'll send it to you if you're ever interested. You can hear it. But, um, you know, being able to play those shuffles is critical in my band. And I point, the, I point the drummers out to that material. And if they really are interested and want to do it, they'll learn it. If they don't, they just, you know, show up, do the gig, and take the money and go home. But the ones that do, they really appreciate those guys like Herbert Henderson, who was the original drummer on that. Did you ever uh, cross paths with him or get to play with him? I don't, I don't know if... I if I got to meet him. Uh, but like, don't lose your can you, cool. You yeah. can hear my chicken, right? Yeah. You get, do you get your own eggs? Yes. Oh, man. I'm an egg fanatic. My band members yeah, we, call, we, call we, me six eggs because I have six I live in the country and we have chickens. Oh, man. That's awesome. I love fresh eggs. <laughs> so that's so, that's how you're able to do that uh, that thing and scratch my back, right? Yes, that little guitar I, thing. I know. Uh, I know firsthand what a chicken sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, get, getting on to disc two. I mean, there's so much music here, but there's a song that I wanted to point out um, that was popularized by by your brother Stevie called "Willie the Wimp," that was actually done by you with Bill Carter. Uh, we're going to be playing that. Uh, we're going to be. Yeah, playing... Bill Carter wrote the song, and I played uh, hit guitar on that album. And that was, uh, and Stevie heard it and then recorded it. So we did it first. That's a perfect song. And that's actually based on a true story to my understanding, right? Yes, yes. And a, another song that's uh, that's on this disc is, is Cold, Cold Feeling. It's, a, it's with Albert Collins. How awesome was it for you to play and back up all these greats, including Albert Collins that we just talked about? Well, when, uh, you know, the club here in town, when Clifford was uh, alive, he he had the Antones Club, and he would hire. Um, he would have once a year. He would have the uh, anniversary show that he would call it, and he would hire everyone that he could uh, get. So he would have, um, uh, and they would play for like ten days in a row, and uh, we were the backup band, so we got to play with. Uh, James Cotton and uh, you know all these different people, Lazy Lester, 
uh, all the people on this record. Yeah. And so uh, a lot of these cuts, you know, are from uh, our live recordings from uh, from Anton's. Cold, cold feeling, actually, which goes back to another great Texan, uh, Mr. T-Bone Walker, who you have an unbelievable story about meeting him. Yes, yes. So you want me to tell you now or what? Uh, you're, you're welcome to, man. That's a beautiful story. Well, when I was a kid, I was like uh, 14 years old, and, I, and it was a B.B. King gig at the Central Forest Club in Dallas, which was in Oak Cliff, uh, where we were from, except it was on, um, it was a, about a $10 cab ride. And um, you had to be 21 to get in. It was B.B. King gig. And he had played Friday, Saturday. And he was going to do a matinee on Sunday. And uh, on Sunday, he uh, called T-Bone Walker, who was in town visiting. You know, he was actually from this area and uh, he called uh, uh, Lil Milton was on the show Freddie King was there uh, <laughs> Come all on. these people all these people were there Lowell Folsom was there uh, and uh, they were all you know it was like a party and uh, at the Central Forest Club uh, which is uh, Central Forest Exit on the uh, on the freeway in Oak Cliff. So I went over there. I was 14. I couldn't get in. And I'm staying at, standing out front. And it's probably about 4 or 5 o'clock. And up walks T-Bone Walker with two little twin girls, like his grandchildren. Yep. And they had on their Sunday dresses and... Uh, ponytails, pigtails, and uh, they were real cute. And he came walking up, and I said, when he walked up, I said, T-Bone Walker. <laughs> and, and he goes, well, yes, son. Uh, what are you doing out here? And I said, well, I, I'm too young to get in. And uh, so, he, so he talked to me for about 15, 20 minutes and told me that he just got back from Europe and I told him I'm a big fan and I and I had this records and and all this stuff and uh, and so he said well I'll tell you what I'll do he said I'll tell um, so and so to let you in the side door he said but don't drink because you'll get us all in trouble right <laughs> and so I said okay I promise I won't drink I'm only 14 Jimmy who and, uh, who in the so world yeah, who in so the, he, yeah, he, go ahead. he let me in, and I got to see the whole show. I mean, again, who in the whole world has ever been admitted into a concert uh, by their, you know, hero and idol like T-Bone Walker? It's just yeah, it, it was incredible. And T-Bone didn't. There was some. It was BB King show, and uh, all the guys were up there with their guitars, and um, T-Bone Walker played organ. Wow. He didn't. He didn't even play guitar. But of course, everybody was up there, and you know how what a great um, um, MC BB King was when he had people sitting in. Yeah, he was just so, as gracious as they yeah. came. And and Little Milton opened the show, so he did. Uh, it was around uh, Grit Saint Groceries time. That was uh, he played all that stuff and opened the show, and then. Uh, all the rest of the people, uh, you know, got up on stage and sat in and sang, and it was quite a show. I, from what you're describing, it's uh, it's heavenly. I mean, just just all the, you know, not all, but uh, a lot of the greats under one roof, and then uh, yeah. and you got and you got admitted for free by T Bone Walker. I got in for free. I went in the side door. <laughs> Don't you know? Speaking of Don't You Know, uh, that is the other, that, that is a song off of disc three that, uh, that we're going to be featuring up next. And um, that's got George Raines on drums, I believe. Yes, yes. George Raines, Bill Willis on the B3, and he's playing bass with the pedals. And then um, 
Um, you know, let's talk about Bill for a second because uh, there's another song from this disc that I'm going to feature called The Ironic Twist, and I assume he's on that as well. Uh, yes. It's a great instrumental. I, I love that, uh, that blues riff on it. I first met you and him uh, up in Toronto at, I think it was called the Regal Theater. It was after uh, Strange Pleasure had been released. You're on a major label, and uh, stylistically, you'd really changed. It's in, in that hiatus from the Fabulous Thunder to be, when you became a solo artist. Uh, it seemed like stylistically, okay, you, you changed from using a pick and I would say a style that was more evocative of the way early B.B. King records sounded, the influence of that, to more of the capoed uh, style, pickless, uh, Clarence Gatemouth Brown, Johnny Guitar Watson, Guitar Slim, all, all come to mind for that. But then, um, you know, you've got the, the organ on there and, and Bill kicking the bass. I actually had a nice conversation with him. He told me that he had played on the original Hideaway uh, by Freddie yes, King. Yes, he played bass. Yeah, he, he played, played bass. Yeah, actually played physical uh, string bass on that. And a bunch of those original... Uh, no, no, he played electric bass. Oh, yeah, I, I, that's what I meant. Uh, like a string bass, just not, not on a keyboard or, or with pedals. That was what I meant. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, and then he'd also told me that uh, he'd played with Billy Holiday and I think James Brown. And then yes. he told me he was from Buffalo and he'd lived in Buffalo for a time. And, yes. and I had mentioned that uh, because I, I'm an inductee into the Buffalo Music Hall of Fame here back in 2007. I think there are so many deserving people that would that should get recognition uh, like him. Um, and, you know, I've mentioned it to them a couple of times. It's kind of uh, nothing's really happened. But uh, maybe at some point you and I could uh, get together and, and see about getting some information to them to submit him for for induction here. Well, sure. Sure. Uh, yeah, he was a uh, he was a great player. He was the uh, for a while he was the house bass player at King Records in Cincinnati. Uh, he played on uh, the first session that he did. He told me was uh, the Five Royals. He played a lot on the Five Royals records and uh, electric that, bass. Best washing machine yeah. in town was that him? Yes. Oh. I think so. I, I I can't be I can't be certain. Uh, well, I don't have the records in front of me, but he played a lot of that, and also, um, you know, he played string bass before that before he got an electric. But mostly, I think at the uh, King Records, he played electric bass, and uh, so his first one was. Uh, Dedicated to the one I love uh, by the Five Royals. Yeah, that's him. That's him going boom, 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 boom. You know what? I think. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, I think we're gonna play that because I have that. I have that track. Oh, good. Thanks. Thanks for telling that story. Another one of the songs that that I wanted to bring up is is a special. It's the it's the non studio version of Six Strings Down, and this is from. I think Austin City Limits and B.B. King, Buddy Guy, Robert Cray, Eric Clapton, Dr. John, and a lot of others are on this. Bonnie Raitt, I think, too, uh, perhaps. And, um, you know, when I think back to that era, uh, that MTV era when they were actually playing music and you guys were on there, um, it, it seemed to me like you guys were the Knights of the Round Table. You know, <laughs> you know, you've used that that image and metaphor before about the magic sword and how it, you know, helped propel you and Stevie and be your vehicle to to you know follow your dreams and travel. But it really just seemed like you know that gold circle of, of uh, of musicians um, came together in such a, a loving way to support you, you know, through that through that tragedy and that that song, uh, really is just uh, it's incredible. Well, uh, that song. Uh, I got that in the mail from uh, the Neville brothers. Uh, I think Art and a couple of the other guys from the Neville brothers wrote that song and they sent it to me on a cassette and said, here, you might like this one. And it was about, uh, you know, Stevie. And, uh, but it was also, so I loved it and um, it inspired me to do that first album 
and to come back and because I didn't uh, after Stevie got killed, I didn't know what to say or do. Yeah, who uh, would? Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? It was my little brother, and I used to take Stevie to the uh, to the bus stop in the morning when we went to school, and it was my job to get him to school and get him back because he was my little brother, right? Yeah. So, so uh, when when that happened, I I didn't really know what to do for a while, so I waited for a few times, and then I got this cassette from Art Neville and uh, a couple of the Neville brothers, and they had this song called Six Strings Down, and, and um, it had a lot of those lyrics, but not all of them. And I, so I took the song, and uh, it had a bridge in it, the original uh, had a bridge in it that said the Rainbow Bridge, and it went off, and it was about Hendrix on the bridge. Okay, so I see. What I did was, I had been listening to, um, I'm trying to think of his name, um, the cowboy, big cowboy from the 40s and 50s, and he did uh, Hillbilly Heaven. Uh, uh, I can't think of his name. I'll think of it in a minute. Okay. But they had a famous record called Hillbilly Heaven. It was about um, all the famous hillbilly guys that had died and were all in heaven singing. And uh, so I thought to myself, well, I'll rewrite this song and put all the guys that I like, you know. Yeah. You know, and so that's, that's what happened. I called them up and said, can I change it? And they went, yes. <laughs> they said, you go ahead. <laughs> oh, God. I I'm sure they were they were more than happy to be accommodating to to collaborate on something just as epic as that was. You know, you and I have had a number of conversations over the years and uh, about different things that uh, that we're you know passionate about. Um, but I don't think I ever told you. I actually met Stevie. Um, I was just a just a burgeoning guitar player in high school, and uh, I had this friend Doug, who uh, introduced me to really blues at large uh, you know he took me to see bb king for the first time that was my first blues concert you know bb king and uh so yeah. what an initiation but yeah. then you know fast forward to him showing me you know stevie's albums couldn't stand the weather scuttle button that type of stuff and there was a a concert you guys were doing together at darien lake up here in new york and I, it was the instep tour i think and Thunderbirds were opening, and it might have rained one day, and then you actually rescheduled a day later. And I remember going to the concert, and after the show, you know, everybody's waiting around, still still tailgating, and all the cars are trying to leave the parking lot. And uh, so I'm just t just giving you these details just to tell you about how the timing of all this happened, you know, for so a special moment for me and my friends. So we decided to get into the car and leave and head on to the, uh, the interstate to get, get back to Buffalo. And um, somebody said, are you hungry on the way home? And we're like, yeah, let's stop. So there was a, a rest stop with a Burger King in it. And okay. we all went in, and except my friend Doug, who had had a few more drinks than everybody. He decided to sleep it off in the car. Biggest Stevie Ray Va Vaughan fan, right? He's in the car. We go inside. And I ordered my two Whoppers with cheese, fries, and a Pepsi. And I turned to my right, and here comes the whole band. Stevie, uh, you know, Reese, Chris, and uh, Tommy. And I believe that the guy that I ended up becoming friends with later uh, from Epic Records, his name is Dave Bouchard. He's a promotions rep. Maybe you remember sure. him. You, you remember David? Uh, he's, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's the one who, who took me to see you up in Toronto because he was trying to get me... Uh, he's trying to get me uh, signed by somebody at Epic if he could at the time, but uh, I, I probably just wasn't developed enough. Anyway, so in walks Stevie, and I was just like, wow. I got to talk to him, compliment him on the show. He was a, uh, incredible, incredibly gracious and gentleman. I shook his hand, and man, what a grip did he had. I mean, he was strong as a horse. I mean, he was just, he, yeah, and... Uh, and I, I told him, I said, I think it's really great that you're, you're really playing uh, 
you know, the way you are right now, true blues, and having um, gone through the whole uh, you know abuse thing and coming out of that clean and sober. And then I said, your sound. I said, your sound is huge. I said, what do you, you know, um, you, you, what do you use for your guitar? I wasn't very, very much into, into much of any gear at the time, but he said, I play a Stratocaster. And uh, I said, what, what kind of pickups? He said, you know, stock pickups. And then I said, but that huge sound, I mean, how do you, he said, I use a tube screamer. <laughs> and uh, I'm just kind of getting a little bit of that Texas drawl from, I, I can remember it like it was like it was yesterday and um right after that i went out and got me a, a strat and a tube screamer <laughs> yeah 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 well wow. you know it, that was the everybody had a tube screamer when they first came out they were they really sounded good and you could turn them down you could turn it on and then turn it down and it gave it a little bit of presence you know it was like you turned the amp up but it wasn't too much so yeah they were they're they're they were a great little uh, pedal. And by the way, my friend Doug did decide to come into the Burger King and got to meet Stevie Ray Vaughan with the rest of us. So, Have you ever thought uh, about the, the, the magnitude of your influence on the aftermarket for Fender guitars and pickups and even even your, your vintage style, you know, with clothing and all that stuff, maybe even with cars too. But have you thought about, I mean, you probably can't put a monetary figure to it, but because of your your influence and your influence on Stevie and Stevie's influence, think about all the pickups and pedals and things people make and amps and speakers and this whole aftermarket thing about really getting picky about your tone. Um, how much how much you've impacted that? Well, well, thank you. Uh, but you know, I, I, it was all selfish. I just wanted to, uh, you know, get a good tone and. I was just, you know, listening to, uh, you know, I wanted to sound like Buddy Guy and Kenny Burrell and and uh, all those BB King and, you know. You do sound like Kenny Burrell on. Um, I hear some of that influence on the uh, the Storm track on disc five. Okay. I'm, I'm coming home. There, you do. Uh, you do a jazz. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I hear that. I mean, of course, that was. You know, Herbie Mann did it, Mel Torme did it, and I think it was written by Ben Tucker or someone uh, in the early 60s. But you do a version of that. I had no idea you were doing that kind of, um, you know, jazz blues thing even as far back as that band. Well, that's that's what I loved. I, I had uh, the first Kenny Burrell record I had was Midnight Blue, and I got that. Uh, that was, you know, right when I first started playing. Uh, so I was always trying to figure out what Kenny Burrell was doing. You know, I could usually copy the head, but then when it when it went to the changes, I was lost. It just when it kind of breaks out in, uh, in the turnaround there and comes back. It's just like, like a chromatic descending chord, right? Yeah, I, I, I love uh, Kenny Burrell. Oh he's yeah, the he's the greatest. Oh man, I love him and Barney Kessel and the stuff Barney Kessel did with T Bone Walker. You know that there was oh, actually, yeah. there was actually a collaboration of you and Jimmy Rogers that I wanted to comment on because, um, the you know Jimmy Rogers he played with T Bone Walker on some of those I think it was some of the Atlantic sides, um, right? And one of the songs was called Why Not, and I love that song. It's just such a happy you know personality it's a it's a plea for his girlfriend you know why not let me be your daddy oh and uh, jimmy rogers i'm pretty sure he was on that that session as guitar and then later on he came out with a song that johnny winter copied that gary moore copied called walking by myself that had the exact same changes so it just shows kind of how the the tradition you know go, goes through and weaves through the music yeah yeah we all we all probably learned uh, from Barney Kessel and T-Bone Walker. So if it wasn't, just think about it, uh, it wasn't for T-Bone Walker. He was the first guy to record the blues on the electric guitar, uh, or at least they say that he was one of the first to make it really popular and record with a, a big band. 
And so if it wasn't for T-Bone Walker, we might all be uh, sounding a lot different. Yeah, him and Clarence Gatemouth Brown. There, there seems to be, yeah, there seems to be like, uh, if you're looking at the, I guess, the, the family tree where things split off from blues to jazz, you know, contemporary. They were the first two, right. Yeah. You know, you've got him and Charlie Christian, T-Bone Walker and Charlie Christian, you know, being contemporaries and hanging out and playing together. But then Charlie Christian goes off and inspires that whole jazz side of thing where Wes Montgomery and Pat Martino and, and all those guitar players flow from, you know, but there's also, you know, not to be, uh, not to forget about, but Django Reinhardt. I mean, he is, he's really the, oh, wells, yeah. the wellspring from, from where a lot of people come from, you know, that vibra oh. that vibrato that BB King, uh, adopted as a style, you know, has, has origins and in, in players like him and Eddie Lang, et cetera. But yeah. It's, it's fascinating. It really is. And then, um, disc five, uh, I'm, some of my favorites on that were, were Baby Please Come Home, uh, of course the Coming Home track that I mentioned, uh, and we just mentioned... Uh, you know, uh, yeah, don't, uh, if you're going to play one, play Wine, Wine, Wine with Billy Gibbons. Okay. Or Hoochie Gucci Man with Soul Man Sam. <laughs> okay. Very... That's a guy. That's a, a guy from Memphis that lives in Austin that plays with us a lot at Sea Boys and Antones and different places. Still to this day down here. No kidding. He, he's a fabulous singer. And we just mentioned uh, Clarence Gatemouth Brown. I'm probably going to want to play your version of Dirty Work at the Crossroads because I play that on my show quite a quite a bit. The original version. I think that's from the Peacock uh, recordings. Yes. Yeah, and you play that at Eric Clapton's uh, Crossroads Blues Festival sometimes when you when you play there. Um, that tour must have been incredible. I mean, just with everything going on right now, uh, playing you know you're you're playing with Eric Clapton. I mean, you're still um, you know doing doing the top stuff with your with your music through through all these decades. It's just just fantastic. Well, I'm I'm very fortunate and. Uh... I, I love to play, and uh, Eric is a great guy. He loves, he loves the same kind of music we do. Yep. So. That's that's and, obvious for sure. So, um, one of my favorite all-time songs of yours. We've talked about this a couple of times. Is Shackles. Yeah. So Shackles on me, and uh, you put a version of this on, on uh, I think it's disc five, and. Yeah. Um, I saw an interview with you somewhere where um, you basically said you feel that music is freedom. It represents freedom to you. So I've been out there using the music is freedom hashtag and <laughs> out on Facebook whenever I post stuff. And um, this song Shackles on me, it's an absolute masterpiece. I mean, you've combined, well, I yeah, you've combined some of the most powerful lyrical images, you know, from the origins of blues music and where it came from with uh, rock solid solo acoustic blues performance. I mean, all that Lightning Hopkins influence, everyone else that you've listened to, the guys from Texas. Uh, Little Son Jackson. Little Son Jackson, that was, yeah, th that was gonna be some, some of my next uh, uh, people mentioned. Um, so, I mean, and it's addressing a subject that is, is really current. I mean, it's in geopolitics, you know. Um, the the concept of surveillance and and, uh, and, and you know excessive overreach. Um, so can you can you talk about that song? Where that recording is from, and maybe tell us a little bit about it. Well, uh, I I did I recorded that at uh, at a studio here in town, uh, just at a guy's house. Uh, um, the version has a, a loud crowd response, though. As oh, you're talking about the there's a live version. I did it at Ron Paul's uh, rally. Love Ron when Paul he, when he was running for president. Uh, they had a big, uh, I think it was St. Paul or Minneapolis. Uh, they had a big rally uh, when he was running for president, which has probably been what two presidents ago. Yes. Or three. No, three. It was three presidents ago. So, anyway, uh, I've always been a Ron Paul fan, and uh, 
it was great to uh, have the opportunity to play at his thing, you know, and it was a bunch of libertarians. So I, I thought I better do shackles. <laughs> That's what uh, libertarians are about. No shackles on me. That's the perfect, perfect metaphor for, uh, for that subject. Well, I think the other thing on here was um, Lightning's Boogie. You know, we talked about Lightning Hopkins, and, and I'm sure you're as well as anybody about uh, his influence in had there been no Lightning Hopkins, you know, some of the people that, uh, that we might not have seen and, you know, in, in the way they developed. Um, you know, when I listened yeah, to... Yeah, Lightning was... Lightning uh, earned his name. Lightning was, was in reference to his guitar playing. Because he was fast and he could uh, hold a whole crowd with just his guitar, he didn't care. He didn't make any difference uh, about the band or any of that. He was he was Lightning Hopkins, and you weren't. <laughs> and so, and I always used to go and see him. Uh, I was I I got to see him like ten times, you know, and he was always unbelievable. And and uh, I never did know what to say to him, you know. Uh, I would try to say, thank you, Lightning. I really enjoy your playing. He'd be like, yeah, what do you want, kid? <laughs> you know? But you he, know, was, he was the greatest. And, and uh, one time, uh, I'll tell you a story about him. One time I saw him on Valentine's Day at, in Austin. And he sang all the whole night. He sang every song. He converted it to a Valentine's Day theme. Like all <laughs> all the songs that he did, he he made it somehow. He made it Valentine's Day. That's creative. That's that's kind of how a rap artist will will do things on the spot, you know, or or people. Uh, yeah, he would he would know. do it on the spot, and uh, plus, you know, his his incredible guitar playing was always just like uh, I don't know. I mean. He would he, captivate is is not strong enough word, you know, for for seeing lightning in person. Well, I would say, you know, like when I hear like the intro to Pride and Joy, uh, or that lead break even earlier by Scotty Moore in Good Rockin' Tonight, uh, on on the Elvis stuff from the Sun Sessions. To me, that sounds like it's it's got its origins in in someone like Lightning Hopkins, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you're, pro you're, you're probably right. I mean, uh, you know, Lightning was playing in the uh, probably in the 40s. He was making records. Uh, so I, uh, he was the greatest and uh, oh, he's definitely one of the greatest and a big, you know, his brothers played too. Uh, there was there were several brothers that also played uh different things and so I, I didn't know he had uh, you know, additional siblings that were musicians just people we had never heard about or unless we know. unless I got it mixed up you know but he was he was fantastic so well I um, you know I think that's that's about all I, I, I wanted to mention about the uh, uh, the recording. Is there anything you wanted to say to, to people about the album or the tour or anything like that? Uh, uh, we've, we've, we've really had great crowds and everything has been a lot of fun. And, uh, um, you know, uh, on disc four, I did my first Hank Williams song. Which song was that? Number 15 on disc four is Hang My Head and Cry. It's Hank Williams. What else? But, uh, you know, also um, a lot of these songs on here, uh, Why, Why, Why is Doug Psalm. That was one of his first records that he made, uh, number 12 in San Antonio, you know, when he was a teenager. When you say Doug, who are you referring to? Doug Psalm. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, in the 50s, uh, he was an R&B rock and roll singer when he was a teenager. Hmm. And uh, that's Why, Why, Why is uh, one of his songs. But anyway, 
Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it's been fun uh, putting this putting this together, and uh, with Malcolm Mills and uh, doing all these different songs. You know, I imagine that that was probably you know precipitated from from the whole 2020 experience where it was uncertain as to whether we were going to be actually going to be able to do it again and and another thing was if um uh, you know just just to have something to do something for your fans something to keep you busy and and creative and and that sort of thing i imagine that played well, into i don't care sense. what anybody i don't care what anybody says i'm gonna keep playing guitar so <laughs> if they don't like it they can stick it yeah, I agree with you, Jimmy. Well, I, I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here again. I could not um, love and respect you anymore for for what you've done to help the direction of my life as a musician and, and being the uh, uh, the honor host that I am here at WBFO. And also, you know, just want to point out that um, you and Stevie and, and, and Eric Clapton and a lot of those guys um, have always, always been quick to point the finger to where you got it from to edify and uh, make sure that uh, the people who created this music uh, were given credit and you've always gone out of your way to include and in, um, and try to make them you know feel welcome and and get them as much publicity as possible and I think that's uh, that's also one of your contributions you know because you know as I referenced the the MTV era and and you being a part of that as much as you might might like Bon Jovi and Poison and those bands, um, they weren't pointing the finger to Little Richard and Chuck Berry and stuff like that. You know, what I mean, you guys yeah. were. So, so again, hats off to you for that. Uh, wish you the best. And uh, again, you're probably going to see me soon. I may I may stop by and see you guys down in Cleveland or Pennsylvania. It's only a three hour drive for me, so I might come All down right. and hang out with you. But again, Hope thanks you know. so much for the time, Jimmy. Uh, have a, have My a, pleasure. God bless you too, Thank man. You. Thank okay. you very much. Bye-bye.